many ways, this is the culmination of the first annual Wonder in Wyoming Festival. We have a number of our featured poets here with us, and to everyone who's joining us on the live stream via the Logos Facebook page, we welcome you into this space to enjoy a liturgically inflected poem sharing experience together, featuring Oak Morse and Ashunda Norris, two of our four inaugural Star Shining Clay Fellows. So I, for everyone in this room who's experienced a Logos gathering a number of times, but for anyone who might be tuning in and is unfamiliar with the format, I'll give just a quick overview of how this event is going to unfold. And I'll start, I'll do so by sharing our story of origin, which some of you in this room have heard before. So Logos began with a conversation. A friend and I were talking about how transactional poetry readings can sometimes feel, how you're either absorbing poetry passively as an audience member, or you're just unloading it on people from the podium. And we started wondering what it might feel like to lovingly, artfully, non-dogmatically incorporate aspects of sacred liturgy and ritual into the format of a poetry reading to curate a space for sharing poems that feels more dynamic and participatory. So out of that conversation grew Logos Poetry Collective, and we typically host these gatherings in person at Lazarus Brewing Company in East Austin. And so imagine yourselves just gathered around a polished oak table beneath well-strung bistro lights with cask aging ale on the walls around you and abundant chips and queso and guac and libations spread before you on the table. Usually it's a very convivial, festal gathering, but we're doing our best to translate it into a variety of contexts, and I think this is the first time we've ever hosted a Logos gathering in the actual sanctuary of a church, which feels fitting and meet and right because tonight we are experiencing something that feels truly sacred. Um, just this past year, Logos and Ecotheo Collective, as we merged, wanted to do something, as in all things, our missions to cultivate wonder, but we really feel that it's crucial not just to celebrate poetry, but also the people who make them. And we want to celebrate poetry that helps us see the world and the people who move through it more clearly so that we might love more clearly whom and what we see and put that love into action. And that effort found a, a sort of blossoming in this collaboration that emerged with Cave Canem, America's oldest home for black poetry in the United States. And we were very blessed to partner with Cave Canem to establish the inaugural Star Shining Clay Fellowship, which supports and amplifies the work of four emerging black poets. And we're so blessed, Oak and Ashunda, to be here celebrating your work this evening. So after this word of introduction, we are going to read an opening text together, and we read this responsively the way we would a poem in church. So you should have an order of service, a program here in front of you, and the bolded lines of this text um, of a poem by Lucille Clifton is going to be our opening invocation, which will set the tone and tenor for the evening. We're then going to hear from each of our three poets, and you'll see that the last poem our poets read is printed for you to read along with. We'll then have a chance to enjoy some curated conversation. And finally, we'll close with a benediction poem, a closing text, A Life in a Steel Mill by Michael Weaver. But this fellowship was formed to honor the work of Cave Canem elder Lucille Clifton, and it takes its title of Star Shining Clay from a line of this poem, Won't You Celebrate With Me? So I'd invite you to just take a moment to ground and center yourselves in the space, to close your eyes if you'd like, to connect with, with your breath perhaps, with with a sense of the Spirit's presence. In all the biblical languages, you find a single word used to indicate both breath and spirit. So in, in Greek, we have pneuma. In Hebrew, we have ruach. In Latin, we have spiritus. And all mean both breath, wind, and spirit. And now let us read together this poem by Lucille Clifton. Won't you celebrate with me? I had no model, both non white and woman. 
I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay. My one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me. Every day. Something has tried to kill me. He has failed. Amen. And now it's my immense pleasure to introduce our first poet, inaugural Starshine and Clay fellow, Oak Morse. These boys got me twisted. How they are sitting here in my classroom saying all the things I wish I could have said when I was their age. I don't like sports. I don't like going to church. It's like these boys are coaches of their own destiny, congregating in the corner, tongues thicker than oak trees, spewing out their truth like they don't care who's watching. So begins Oak Morse's exquisite lyric meditation, Silence. One of the many intensely incandescent pieces included in the poet Starshine and Clay Fellowship application sheaf. The poems in this collation build and braid, coalesce and cascade, and ultimately both move the reader to admiration for the speaking voice, at once powerfully assertive and moving in its vulnerability, and also galvanize a vision. Leave one wanting to catalyze a conversation about how our lives, communities, and cultures have been and can be better built. In silence, the speaker's wonderment at the self-assured vitality of these students leads to a moment of disclosure that reads like a confession. Quote, so I put in my mouth guard, line break, and repented. If repentance means turning away from one toxic way of living and thinking to a different, more redemptive way of seeing, then these are poems that not only embody such a saving gesture, but also invite the reader to live into such movements of inner revision in the context of our lives. Inaugural Starshine and Clay Fellow Oak Morris was the winner of the 2017 Magpie Award for Poetry in Pulp Literature. He was a finalist for the 2020 Witness Literary Award and a semi-finalist for the 2020 Pablo Neruda Prize for Poetry. Oak's work has appeared in Strange Horizons, Pank, Beltway Poetry Quarterly, Nimrod, Cosmonaut Avenue, Solstice, and as of this summer, Eco Theo Review, among other venues. He has received fellowships from Brooklyn Poets and 12 Literary Arts, he is a Houston Texan Stars in the Classroom recipient, a Pushcart Prize nominee, and a Warren Wilson MFA student. Said candidate in your bio. Oak lives in Houston, Texas, where he teaches creative writing and performance and leads a youth poetry troupe, the Phoenix Fire Spitters. As a poet and educator, Oak Morris's poems and way of moving in the world remind me of the true meaning of poetry as poesis, a word that it's, at its root means doing or making, and reminds us that words are nothing if they can't help us see the world and individuals who move through it more clearly so that we might love more truly all that we see and put that love in action. Lines from the conclusion of silence witness to just this sort of lived poesis, lifting from an act of praise to wondrous prayer. Morse writes, these boys make me born again breaking me out of the boy into the man I had longed to be. May the hammer never come down on their tongues. May they never be curled up and closed. How blessed we are to be made born again in the baptism of vision offered in such a poet's work. How blessed we are to be broken wholeheartedly and unabashedly open by the work and presence of such an inspired and inspiring poet as we welcome to wonder Oak Morse. Uh, first of all, I want to start off by saying thank you to Logos, Eco Theo Review, thank you to Kavi Conum, and thank you to Travis, thank you to Jason, thank you to Greg. And thank you to all the kind people and your kind words. I'm the crack in the porch with the broken screen door behind it. An old bed sheet for a curtain till mama get a taxes. 
a statistic with a crooked future. Another birth certificate that got to be kept up with. I'm representing everything that made me and everything that I am made out of. I'm the career from the yard sale that's on its last leg but fit perfectly in our budget. I'm the note home after the first week of school because I still ain't got all my school supplies yet. I'm Del Monte, Chef D on Al 2. I am equate in great value. I'm low income. I'm the long lost daddy who dashes from responsibility, the ghost that was too afraid to show his face. A mama's haircuts with a skint hairline. A mama's got to do what a mama's got to do. I'm the chip tooth from playing freeze tag outside on the concrete. I'm the Medicaid that went covered. I'm the Dollar Tree, the Salvation Army, the WIC program, and the food bank at the church on Sunday morning. I'm low income. I'm connecting the dots and embracing where I came from. Because you don't know where you're going until you know where you came from. I am pillar to post, post to pillar. No pot to piss in. The knots upside my head from the other foster kids. Counselors and defects all up in my business. The irregular behavior and the rippling they tried to recommend. I am singing in the fan on my downtime. I am singing in the fan when I'm down, finding solitude in the center of chaos. I'm low income. I am prayers that don't quite make it to heaven. Hope that I can't quite keep my hands around. The sun don't know how to shine on this neck of the woods, y'all. It's the same old, same old. Bad luck and bad news. But we're used to it. I am outgrown draws and unaired dirty laundry. I am demons chasing me, but I'm fighting back. I'm pressing onwards. I'm pushing all the way through. I am tears that turn into art. The drawings of a better life in the back of my three-ring binder. I'm the youngster who don't see the projects made out of bricks, but made out of stepping stones. I'm on bar behind the four corners of the block, dividing and rationalizing why things don't always add up to be equal. I'm the 14-year-old workaholic who ain't turning back, who's juggling goals, grazing a job. Call me a magician. I'm planting seeds to grow a beanstalk that would take me right out of here. I'm low income. The voice I didn't even know I had. The storyteller that makes his English teacher smile. The flame-filled passion that makes me smile. I'm Art Awards, honorable mentions. Wherefore, out there, Romeo and the Negro who speaks to rivers. And I thank the struggle for it all. It's designed who I am today. Every piece of me, every part of me, chasing success and finding possibilities in the eyes and speaking on it with conviction right here with my feet planted in the ground. I'm a product of my environment. You hear the irony in that? My name is Oak Morris. Oak comes from the oak tree. It's the strongest tree in the forest, a symbol for southern strength and very deep-rooted. Morris comes from Samuel L. Morris. He's the inventor of the telegraph for Morris Cole. So you put those two words together, you get deep-rooted message, Oak Morris. Loose things. Grandma had hook hands. She knew how to slam a car door. How to high speed swerve around a curve as if she was fleeing from hell like the gatekeepers on judgment day misdirected her. Ooh boy, shut the door when the passenger side would fly open. A sunny day in an ancient white Oldsmobile can easily become an intense scene from a horror film. Grandma, why don't you get the door fixed? Something may happen. It is fixed, boy. You just don't shut it all the way. We leave the gas station. Grandma slams on the brakes at the red light, makes the sharpest left turn as if we're skidding on the Earth's axis. The door flies open. A prostitute jumps in it. This next poem I wrote after I read this article, um, surprising article, I found out that every nine seconds, a woman in America is being beaten. So this poem is in response to that. It's for the abusers. Your hands are not designed to hit a woman. Your hands are designed to hold. 
to brace, to lift her chin up professing that we're in this together. Your hands are designed to scrape up coins when funds get low. Do what you got to do. Sometimes misplace your ego so you can receive charity just to secure your own. Your hands are designed to climb your way up the corporate ladder, to carry a briefcase, 10 key your way through technology, stroll the trash out on Monday mornings, trim the hedges before the sun leaves, answer the phone when your boss is calling, wash your work clothes for the J-O-B, burn up a meal for breakfast, then fan out the smoke detector when it feels like hell is about to attack, then turn around and let her know this is not even half of what you can do while the other hand is tied behind your back. Your hands are designed to snap in the name of the Lord, then fold for forgiveness. Your hands are designed to trade in your player's cards for a hand in marriage. Your hands are designed to sign your child's name down on that birth certificate. Your hands are designed to hang up decorations during the holidays, to photograph memories so they won't dwindle away. See, listen, in the composition of your hands, the muscles are minute, nearly negligible. But when balled up for a punch, the hand has a force of 8.9 meters per second. Your hands weren't made for that gravitation. Your hands are not tools to create destruction. Your hands are tools to build a house into a home, to build a fire when it's cold. Teach your son how to spin that football. Make sure it travels across the globe so he'll know nothing is impossible. Your hands were designed to protest for the powerless preventing injustice. Your hands were designed to pledge allegiance to our flag and applaud our leaders. Your hands were designed to adjust your glasses so you can see things outside of a crooked realm. Undo a system of doings in the way they've been done. Bid on hands history to change. Mend the mistake. Then wipe the sweat alongside your face. Scoop up your keys. Fly back to your safe haven. The only place you know is home. And after a long day of hard work, locate your sanity, the one who says I love you, and hug her around her neck. All right, so the next two poems I'm going to do are actually in the Eco Theo Journal um, Summer Edition. So if you have not gotten yourself a copy, please get yourself a copy, okay? <laughs> Um, this poem is titled Glacier. Um, and also feel free to also find me on social media at Oak Morris and connect with me there. I love staying in contact with um, other poetry um, admirers and poets. Glacier. Mama made me promise not to let him in. The man she called Babe, especially when they would drink Budweiser's and let Newport smoke pale their faces. The man who helped us move, live with us on and off. And when his presence was gone, when, when he was gone, his presence still roamed. The man who served ginger tea and massaged vapor rub on my mama when she was trapped in bed with the flu. The man who worked 60 hours a week chasing chickens with boiled and blistered hands as if he had permanent poison oak who made sure we had a roof over our head and heat. The man who taught me what, what an allowance was and not to spend it all on Reese's and Fago at the convenience store. The man who cut the phone cord when, with a butcher knife while mama badmouthed him to her friend. I was standing in a tiny sunroom, the one they made into my bedroom. He left the knife on the floor. Mama became as cold as a glacier. I hear the knife. I didn't want anything else to cut into our bond. He grabbed a bag, then dissolved into the world. Mama and I stayed up, twisted in sheets, watching cheap movies from Walmart. A boom came from the door like the house being kicked off its brick limbs. 
fighting words, and fury fired back and forth through the rattling wooden door. I wanted forgiveness to land on this house. Instead, shards of glass erupt from the door window. I, trapped in a gaze, fingers pulsating, mama ran for the kitchen, back with the iron skillet. Strike upon strike, she crushed his hands to nothingness. Flesh appearing and disappearing, trying to grab the weapon of rage, blood spilling. His sister, a frantic voice. Stop! Stop! Please stop! A bloody nightgown, a breeze singing around the ceiling, and red and blue lights sirening the darkness. I told him I wasn't opening that door. Mama duct taped a black garage bag over the mouth of the window. In the morning, a bowl of bleach and hot water sat at my feet. Mulberry droplets splattered. Our screen porch covered in freckles. Mama told me to scrub the floor again. She fixed the door. The union he made for us split like the window and I wanted to pick up every chip. He was the last man I saw who tried to love a glacier. All right. So let me end it with something a little more lighter. <laughs> um, this last poem is um, on your brochure there. It's called Mount Everest Be Jealous. Um, and I want to say thank you guys for lending me your ears. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. Thank you guys so much for your encouragement and your energy. All right. Let's jump into Mount Everest. Be jealous. I want shoulders bigger than the Million Man March. They got to be pronounced turtleneck assassination. Cotton squealing for mercy. Funny. We'll ransack our sanity for a voice that says we can look better. Whatever. I don't mind the heaviness, even if it means difficulty balancing. I want shoulders big enough for a one-man football team. Let sweat take years to slide off my shoulders. Ladies, don't leave me alone. Tis the season for a new wave of sexy. Each lift in the gym is a millimeter closer to what we may never see. Genetics should change its name to bad news. Always reminding us of impossible heights. I want shoulders that are a threat to goons before I can enter a room. Way too big for snapbacks to fit. I want custom fashions to beg for my endorsement. Place me in a vanity fair spread, only with a pen and pad covering my privates. Let me love me, hate me, save me from fantasy, gut out my bulky daydreams of a woman waking up kissing me on the back of my deltoid, ban me from my image, or grant me shoulders mammoth enough to block me from it, and self-esteem be asleep, says it ain't got nothing to do with it, overcompensate my lack of happiness. Supplement my person with boulders that belong on no human, but far off in valleys where my self-image sometimes may drift off through the mist and murk overstretching of what's sexy in this world. But underneath, it all be too much, abundant and plentiful, too heavy for air to even pass through. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Oak, for those deep-rooted messages. That was an abundant and plentiful reading. Uh, that was really wonderful. And I just feel so glad and lucky and joyful to be here with you all and to be celebrating Oak and Ashunda and Greg. I want to acknowledge our two other fellows who aren't able to be here with us this evening, Asma Jama and 
Michael Frazier. Michael lives and teaches in Japan, and Ozma is in the United Kingdom. So we're going to be doing a virtual reading with them later this year in, in October with Malcolm Tariq, who I also want to acknowledge and thank for all of the work that he did to help Travis and, and I to make this collaboration between Ecotheo Collective and Kave Kanam so meaningful, as well as just a, a joy to work on with, with everyone involved. We had amazing first readers. I know Tyree Day was one. I'm uh, blanking on, on the others. There were four of them who did a great job of screening. We had over 300 applications this first year, so I think that testifies to the power of poetry and, and the wonder that is Kaveh Kanem, as well as the wonder that is the legacy of Lucille Clifton. So thank you to, to everyone, and especially to Greg for reading. I know they, they screened down, but I think you still had 50 or so folios of, of work to go through, and, and so we're really blessed to be here with, with Oak and Ashunda this evening, and now I have the great pleasure of introducing our next poet. For you are an empire of your own doing, a channel spilling forth greatness, Ashunda Norris declares in the Gospel according to Mary Magdalene. More precisely, it's chapter 3, verse 9 of the Gospel. Thank God for this apocryphal good news, this gospeler who tells us there is no sin here in this new sun galaxy. Updating Whitman's appellation of a cosmos, one of the roughs, Norris declares herself a beloved, a powerful, a holy. There is both holiness and power in Norris's poems, which have the paradoxical qualities of feeling both eternal and transcendent, as well as utterly contemporary, personal, specific. Consider the closing lines of Betty Draper's depression is too relatable for comfort. None of us deserve to exist in a police state without an impassioned ancient love settling into our bones. Norris's poems celebrate Sun Ra's audacity and Coltrane's dearly beloved and erase Elon Musk's Mars and beyond. They are, as the title of one poem makes clear, Made in America. That poem, about the curious Twitter following of O.J. Simpson, reminds us that the Heisman winner joined the social media site on the 25th anniversary of the murders of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. Norris explores and interrogates the relationship between play and violence, our obsessions with celebrity and our desire for genius. Her poems fulfill that old task of good preaching. They afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Norris is an award-winning filmmaker, feminist, archivist, and poet living in Los Angeles. Her honors include fellowships from Cave Canem, the New York State Summer Writers Institute, and a residency at the Lemon Tree House. Ashunda's writing has appeared or is forthcoming in Fence, Pank, Trampoline, La Pressa, Bayou Magazine, and of course the summer issue of Ecotheo Review. Her most recent film work, Mino, A Diasporic Myth, has screened nationally and internationally, including in Amsterdam, Berlin, and Nairobi, Kenya. Born and raised in the heart of rural red clay Georgia, Ashunda loves hot water cornbread, obscure cinema, stargazing, the ocean, and celestial Sirius. Keepers of the spirit, Norris implores at the end of Hoodoo Manifesto, open the gate up. The gate has already opened for this visionary maker, and I expect we will be reading and seeing much more of her brilliant work in years to come. How blessed we are that Greg Pardlow selected her as one of the four inaugural Starshine and Clay Fellows. Along with Kave Kanem, we are delighted to honor this acolyte of Lucille Clifton. Friends, 
Won't you celebrate with me a Shunda Norris? Oh, my goodness. Um, thank you so much, Jason, for that introduction. I'm super emotional. Oh, my goodness. Um, i first like to thank um, Echo Theo Review, the Logos, especially Kaveh Kanem, which has changed my life. Um, Greg, thank you. Um, Travis, Jason, Oak, I'm just really happy to be here um, today. Um, yeah, so let me start. Oh, goodness, let me loosen up a little bit. <laughs> that was just overwhelming to me. I really appreciate when people can see my work um, in a way that I didn't expect them to. So just honored about that. I'm going to start um, with the gospel according to Mary Magdalene, chapter 3. There is no sin here in this sun galaxy. Let us now praise the Nicholas who shall be blessed, a beloved, a powerful, a holy. Form your own roots and look to the fruit of the sky's land to honor yourself. Be wary of a world chewing off its own truth. Proclaim the mind a treasure of souls who answer with wisdom. Desire is a bind of hot-tempered weeping. Stand in your Savior's place as the disciple of her Lord's unwavering voice. For if you believe in the spirit of Mayat's daughters, you are loved and belong to no one but yourself. Hark, mightily woman, you seven forms of seven souls, wrathful, burning at the eels of this realm. For you are an empire of your own doing, a channel spilling forth greatness, kings ascending on high. Um, this next poem I wrote um, in honor of Mary Turner, who lost her life um, in Georgia in 1918. Lowndes County, Georgia, 1918, for Mary Turner. I left Folsom's Bridge the night they seared my skin with gasoline and white dreams. To this day, oak trees make me pause in flight. I've been dignified, but now my self-worth swelters above sassy moonlit shadows. I was bound, hands and feet, flipped upside down. Them flames coyed me till I was a smug inferno, swallowed a thousand bullets for my pride, taught a good lesson with motor mania and a dying womb crushed into Georgia clay beneath her mama's roasted head. When a parcel of pale pink brutes taste blood, somebody need calling besides that God they serve, a failure in bounds for sure. My love for Hazel cost me earth realms, but I begin again with the same fate if I get to jet through split seconds to be a cosmic onance for little black ladybugs, sunless without my blazing baptism of black heat. Self-portrait as Drunken Night in Undergrad. Everybody remember those Drunken Nights? Can't remember anything. It's 4 a.m. trying to get to your dorm room. <laughs> Self-portrait as Drunken Night in Undergrad. Even when the cue juice rams itself through my liver, I keep seeing my high school drama teacher at the door, collecting money, handing out drink tickets, whole of my slim body ready to be fucked split sideways in Ricky's dorm room, he had to go and say, you all grown up now. His voice, a slime toad in my ear, quicksanded Ricky right out my mental. My sister always saw bow between his begging eyes, her friend a trap threshold loose in his grimy paws. Rumor had it he fingered a girl. Rumor had it he fingered girls in the folds of his classroom between ungraded monologues and his favorite stapler. I hit him here, a poem, a law, built to unbind black sheriffs from Folsom Fangs. Um, I've been trying to write about R. Kelly for a very long time, um, and it's just been overwhelming. So this is the poem that I, come, I came to um, once I figured out how to, to write about him. On watching R Surviving R. Kelly, 
You understand nothing if you do not have to imagine your own abuse replay every time another black girl opens her mouth. Upturned and overcomplete, I'm the yarn spilled beneath the mold no one bothered to gaze upon. The black girl weeps. I see myself, a tender excuse barked at to be grateful for having him, not some other chump unproud of yanking bikinis, smacking fat asses at a pool party I'm excluded from. Leon was too old for me with my rim bursting stars face. Either way, I'm not whole no more. Who really wants to deal? Perhaps it's more impressive to accentuate that when people ask how things are going, they don't really want to know, be bugged down in my sad mania disguised as rage. My therapist says, I'm mourning the loss of an undead sister. And the grief wrecks me. A bride of casket stabbing heated cotton fields. My sister's manic curses slice through my father's prayers mid-request. And what else is there for God to do except initiate the remainder of a demise? She demented a shell, a dead mind, church fire, shut up in bones. My therapist's office is an inferno of lies. I pretend to never drink alone, rosé on breath two hours before work. And who can rescue other folks' kids when my body is no longer my own and stuck in Georgia, planted to a sofa, mouth glued tight, watching Ray, followed by dream girls, then why do fools fall in love on repeat over cake, coffee, and burnt toasted pecan pie? After the failed intervention, my father escapes to the carport, eating tears. My mother tore the phone to gossip her pain away. Two days later, I'm on a plane to London, no time for weeping. Who can afford the years it actually takes to give sad what it deserves? The part of me willing to survive crushes itself to the where the light bleeds, tongue, And imagine what it must be like to crawl into the gates of hell no one recognizes but my sister's past and a suffering. I know what it means to not last and then recover. I'm a million ants overrun with gloom, the locked chalice aching for a tender hand. Um, My grandmother, who is now an ancestor on my um, mother's side, would always say, you can't help what come up on you. Um, and that's the title of this poem. Hope I can get through it. Um, give me y'all energies, please. Um, you can't help what come up on you. A Grandma O.C. proverb. It's 90 degrees in a Georgia August, and there goes my sister marching down Buckeye, bearing fingers twirled around a $30, 30-gallon dollar store trash bag full of no one knows what the fuck, and she got that determined gait on her, strutting in her madness. My aunt on the phone telling me, your sister walked for five minutes and rest in a ditch for 10. That's when I think on the one time my sister ran, walked down the house to a church, sat right on those church steps, and told the police she was resting. Resting for what, say 12? And my sister say she training for a marathon, even though it's pushing 100, and she ain't left the house in a year and some change. Tail end of sorrow in my mama's eyes, watching a wonder deteriorate beneath her own shadow. It's about three hours later, and my sister's still trudging tra- tra- down that highway like it's our backyard. One of my cousins just want to haul off and lug her lanky ass right in his car. Reason she's stumping down the road in the first place is because she don't want to go to the doctor. She served and served papers, and when she get them handed to her, told my mama, I ain't going nowhere, and you can't make me. That's when she packed that big old trash bag and called herself leaving for good. Sheriff finally sent somebody down to help, and my sister told them she filing a complaint because she a law-abiding citizen. And all she doing is walking down the road. That ain't breaking no laws. Deputy go on to say he got some papers that she got to go to the doctor. My sister turning on what she think is charm brilliance. Whose signature is this? A judge didn't sign off on this, so I want to file a complaint of harassment. On who, say the deputy. My sister tell that man she complaining on her whole family and his office too. By now, deputy all impatient and tired of going back and forth with my sister's mania. She got two choices. 
get in the car or get put in the car. She get in the car. It's three days later, and my sister in a psych ward refusing to give them A's permission to hand the cold cow out to my mama. I act like I don't care. I can't call my sister and check on her. I act like it's not a stance she done made against the family. I try not to take it personal. I act like I got two sisters instead of three. Last poem in the program is called Hoodoo Manifesto. And you can follow along in the program. Hoodoo Manifesto. I am my own myth, a philosophy of cosmic origins a planet, red clay, Nubian folklore, Kemet before Kemet, old tradition, black belt, do my mainline work at midnight hour, spirits move, bewitching in a little word in church, a saint, a building of refusal, fed till I won't no more, got a mama praying for me mighty, a soul on fire, a leap in liberation, be open, free dreams of future, a return to past, which is now, then again, the present, a galactic phenomena, bitch, all my grandma's egoons, a rain supreme with a cayenne peppered nine inch machete. Try me if you want to. I want it all back, up in here taking all they land back, all they time back, all they peace back, speak abundance over this lineage. Psalm 91 equals uh, read it and see. Been to the water, chilled my body, not my life path, nothing one. Other mothering be my child free legacy. Everybody ain't worthy of me. Meditation time, stargazing for sky people, conjuring be, you know if you know, pay attention. In close encounters of the third kind, ships hover at the crossroads. Congo complete. None but the righteous shall seek my glowing face. See me apply practical knowledge, engineer my faith. Technology be in how I speak, black and sure. Feds will read this and stutter. Doorway to my own nation. Send messages over time. Gregorian clock, a scam I use to master destiny. More than a conqueror, a wall-trapped bee nesting, my very existence bittered, sweet-honeyed bitch, plowing deep on buckeye, magic doses daily, motherboard be a gathering of healers, church pews be spaceships parked, hear my ancestors speak through whoever calls from Georgia, message be God, message be we flesh divine, message be ain't no ways but your way, move forward, Come back home, stitch, boned, fabric ancient and black. Listen to your elders, or they gonna come back riding you every night. Earth moves when I say hoodoo. Keepers of the spirit, open the gate up. Shonda, thank you so much for opening the gate up to such beauty, truth, transcendence, and oak. I mean, this, I, re I really do feel like this partnership with Kaveh Kanem of anything we've done as Logos, as Ecotheo, is the work we feel most honored to undertake and what we're just most proud of and feel so deeply humbled and grateful to be in this collaboration with a, an, an institution we respect so much and to be here celebrating you two as fellows is amazing and we can't wait to be with Ozma and Michael and, and Malcolm as, as well in October and to have a chance to introduce you Greg a poet we love and respect so much is such a tremendous honor as well and so we're we've decided to try something we haven't done before and lean into Logos's sort of participatory antiphonal responsive way of um, celebrating poetry and introduce you together um, and antiphonally his rough hand in mine inflates like a blood pressure cuff, and I squeeze back as if we are about to step together from the sill of all resentment and timeless toward the dream source of unneeding, 
the two of us hurdle, sharing the cosmic breast of plenitude, when I hear the coins blink against the surface and I cough up daylight like I've just been dragged ashore. These lines from Wishing Well, one of the innumerably luminous lyrics of Gregory Pardlow's Pulitzer Prize winning collection, Digest, confronts the reader with a scene that seems on the surface fairly unremarkable. A man outside the Metropolitan Museum is confronted by someone he assumes will ask him for change. Instead, the interlocutor asks the speaker to take hold of his hand as he throws two coins into a wishing well. Pardlo describes the moment as one of transformation and breaks from a relatively common diction into a language reaching for ineffability. The effort to get at the unsayable through any means possible, through vividness of image, syntax that swerves and sees and memes the variegations of the mind and thought is a hallmark of Pardlo's work and ultimately leaves the reader changed. Pardlo writes that every good poem has a moment of turn, of breaking free or out. He writes, the volta is special in that it marks the moment when the poem breaks its deepest and most characteristic habit. Pardlo's poems remind us that it is always possible to experience such turns and transformations if we can attend closely enough not just to the texts of poems, but also of our own lives. In addition to Digest, Gregory Pardlow is the author of Totem, winner of the APR Honickman First Book Prize. As well as Air Traffic, a memoir of ambition and manhood in America. Which was listed on numerous top ten lists, including the BBC, Vogue, the New Jersey Monthly, and the New York Times. He's the translator of the full-length poetry collection Pencil of Rays and Spike Mace by Danish poet Niels Lingsu. His poems, reviews, and translations have appeared in the American Poetry Review, Callaloo, Poetry, Harvard Review, Plowshares, Gulf Coast, and on the National Public Radio. He's the recipient of fellowships from New York Foundation for the Arts, Cave Canem, the McDowell Colony, the Seaside Institute, the Lotos Club Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation, and a translation grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. Pardlow is poetry editor for the Virginia Quarterly Review and is director of the MFA program at Rutgers University Camden. He lives in Brooklyn and is the guest judge of the inaugural Starshine and Clay Fellowship. His introduction to the work of the fellowship winners and finalists appears in the summer 2021 issue of Eco Theo Review, along with a fabulous interview that he did with Esteban Rodriguez, our interviews editor. Such a trifling bargain, flowers for mercy, Pardlow writes in the 11th section of his sequence, Jornada, on faith. And in the next line, he accuses nature of being a predatory lender. In these two lines, we find the distillation of Pardlow's poetics, a bold yet accurate wit, a swiftness and sweetness of music and line, and a searching, searing commentary on the economies in which we entangle ourselves. There is mercy and predation, bargains, but they're trifling. I don't know what is in me I can't contain, Pardlow writes in his poem, Bipolar, a neat inversion of Whitman's claim of largeness. Pardlow does indeed contain multitudes, and multiple are the pleasures and poignancies we find in his poems and prose. Incarnate the page, he commands. Give words the body you consume. There is a host for this feast we are about to enjoy. Please welcome Gregory Pardlow. I'm just really honored for the opportunity to serve 
play my little role in this, my little violin in this beautiful orchestra. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Um, thank you all. This has been a fantastic few days. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to read, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to read some new poems. Um, <laughs> Uh, do you guys know what a dibble is? Mark does. Mark does, and you know, yeah? Yes. Mark, what's a dibble? Like the gardener would know, yeah. A, a seed dibble, right, yeah. So it's a tool used for making a hole in the ground to plant seeds. It kind of looks like, it reminds me of the, um, the icing um, tube, right, where you make designs on a, on a cake. It's kind of like that shape. Um, and some of you will remember the um, Bernini's uh, sculpture um, of St. Teresa. There was a meme with Lindsay Lohan. Have you? No? No, I'm, I'm, the, I'm, I'm, I'm alone in my, in my social media obsession. <laughs> so there was a meme of, of poor Lindsay Lohan passed out uh, in her car, and next to her there's a photo of St. Teresa, um, Teresa Avila in Bernini's sculpture in the exact same pose. And, they, and the, you know, she's got her hood on, they both have hoods on, so it's this, it's this really, really interesting juxtaposition. Um, that only plays a small role in the, in the poem. This is uh, from a, but I like talking about it. This is from a, a series uh, called Nunsploitation. But this, this seed dibble and cautery tool, blushing for the fever mad, this marble and bronze opera, idols, an engine of reverence in the tourist economy, Bernini has distilled as ecstasy, this live electric, this tantric sneeze. Could Bernini have rendered a pleasure not got at the end of a spear, the highest angel haunted Teresa Avila like a Motown hook and prodded her body quiverish with love's heartburn, a rapture fantasy fathomed by her innermost yoga, her spirit let open like a sack of lightning bugs. To complement the head lull and hoodie of a starlet's bender slept off in agony glorioso, Bernini lifted Teresa's story like a shipwreck from its ecclesiastical groove and mimicked her signature miracle, levitation, which she murmured into her sackcloth and wimple. He left Teresa's left foot exposed as if to bait a bedside tidbit, the devil for whom she had no fear, for he appeared to her toy-sized and black and dropped by to make her pound air with laughter, all weightless, all risen by pinch and tickle, until she wet him with holy water. Ecstasy, then, this cliffhanger, this mercy of exultation and taboo. So I had a very, it, it's a good thing being a friend of uh, Spencer's for many reasons. What <laughs> I've had so many amazing experiences as a, a kind of just the, the bounty that, that is Spencer, just always giving. Um, one of which was the opportunity to go to Civitella as a, um, a residency in uh, Umbria, Italy, in a 14th century castle. And the woman who uh, runs it, um, Dana, Dana, Dana Prescott is, um, was a, an art historian, and she would take the fellows on these trips throughout town, throughout the region, rather, um, one of which, and many people in this room, have been ch uh, a challenge to write a poem in response to um, the, the Madonna del Parto, which is a, a fresco, um, I don't I think, Mark, you have one too, right? No. I know Paisley does. 
You, oh, that's right, that's right, yeah. I know, I know Paisley does, I, yep, I'm very much in conversation with that poem, yeah. What's that? Yeah, yeah. So this is my contribution to that very long conversation that, that's going on. Did you write one, Spencer? I love that image, but no, I didn't write Yeah. Okay. This one's called Magnificat. Monterchi. A village named for a mountain named for Hercules, before names, was known for contagious fertility. And twice since church fathers blamed every human weakness, want, and conflict on Eve's sin and ordained Diana's altars and her magnificence destroyed and overwritten, the earth inside the mountain kicked. Nothing happens once. Even the infinite is a rhythm, a pulse the image of itself in all things repeated. Contractions, the landscape in sympathetic labor with Madonna del Parto, a painting the way a fossil is a rock. Her baby bump echoes the hill of Tepayac where Juan Diego reimagined Tenanson as La Morenita, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Her affect, flat as Mount Carmel, where hermits heard wind crying Mary, the music in Piero's painting in Monterchi pushes the envelope of public art. Said to protect expecting pilgrims, this quattrocento fresco's ultrasound revealed beneath the pregnant virgin another lair, bearing Mary by an earlier master, babe already at the breast. Like cities upon cities, form reflects Mary's depth, and this palimpsest buries and nurtures its stories at once. When nature's seismic choir magnified the earth, broke it like water, glassy and fragile, the sylvan chapel's load-bearing saint was at last emancipated and kissed between wind-drunk cypresses by an ardent sun. She from ruin, carried like a shelter, protected by whom she protects. The pious, who claim daylight quickened beneath pigment, the adrenaline in Piero's latent cartoons. The artist, tutored by Euclid, Pythagoras, Alcharismi, might have pictured this bride of a double groom spooked by the angel at the palm tree. Would that I died before this, Mary laments in the Quran, which shows her nevertheless persist in counting down to Anno Domini. Fun fact. The word for womb in Hebrew also means compassion. Imagine, before using the Baptist baby John to gender reveal Jesus, Mary asking Elizabeth's thoughts on Hecuba, getting her girls to lay in wait and scoop the eyes of the king who heaved her son from a parapet. Not often was Mary without a book. Or sharing fears of becoming a coffin or sharing our mother's fears of the beloved child slain by a cop who claims his fear is proof of his heroism. Piero enshrined her, a proto-feminist ode to labor, sovereign as thrice-wed Urzuli, who commands men to venerate the source of creation. Working seven days, Piero hoped to have God the mother's kind of compassion, he wanted to make a thing so well it grows holy, becomes the beholder, and the creator becomes the thing beheld. The mural sounded pronouns when she outlived the latest quake, as if to be recognized as a woman she had to endure trauma. In sundry tongues below her, prayers and baskets since have spelled requests like quizzes she might check for penmanship and grammar inside her sunless classroom Every pupil swells to grasp the lectures she radiates. The schoolhouse turned gallery is a compromise, a halfway home where she may convalesce in calming UV lights while the search for her forever home continues. One brainchild town fathers had was to lease her like a sideshow Venus to underwrite a new church. A wall of mothers rose in her defense. And when those same powers that be invited artists in Florence to come and restore her, locals say the mothers laid their bodies in the street. Not to weep or pray the hog's hair brushwork remain chaste, nor that the angels' true colors not streak a sad mascara from their pinions to the pleats of their frocks. Not in repent, but as an athlete genuflex, 
the Madonna's host of votaries who, like Madres de los Desaparecidos, would spare no cost defending the glory vestals bricked inside cathedral walls lost their lives achieving to show where beat the Madonna's infinite heart. Inside the matrix of their care, she'd be more than just a work of art. And these are some other, uh, I'm gonna read just a couple short, two, three, well, maybe not, okay. We'll see. Uh, these are uh, other poems from that series that, uh, that Jason mentioned uh, on Faith. Bathing in the milk light of the boob tube in a house that moved like a shipwreck with curtains that sieved wind through midnight portals. I wormed my finger down the back of my jammies to see what the fuss was about. For once, my dad's asthma had not announced him like Darth Vader emerging from the dark corridor. His gaze left me clean as an x-ray, a cartoon cat struck by lightning. Gravity wanted nothing to do with me, tisked at having seen that boy on the floor watching TV with his finger in his ass. Last week, I lay on my side delirious and watched as from the bridge of a tiny spaceship, a greased lens expedition through my colon. And I thought of you, dear Lord Vader, the only family history my doctor fears and prayed for health as I only know how. I introspect with borrowed vision. Noah's son, naive to the body's exposures and its sovereignty of shame, inherited neither the map nor the jurisdiction. Father, you live forever as a voice in the mail, a voicemail in the cloud. In the twilight of half sleep on the gurney, I thought I called for you. I dreamt I cursed not you, but your descendants. That's a reference, by the way, to um, the story of Ham, right? And Ham, okay, I got it. Cool. Right crowd. <laughs> An old husband's tale reckons that witches are children of sexless angels and their human eunuchs, angels whose self-restraint is inversely proportional to their power to silence their victims the deniable offspring, the Zeus-like ravishment from above. Paul said women should wear an authority on their heads, by which he meant a veil, like a force field, to protect them from lustful angels. Adam copped angel lust from those self-same freaky mayflies who in turn learned their grift at God's extensive digit bulbing like molten glass at the end of a blowpipe. God got his from Greeks. Thus completes, like a network of shell companies, the history of qualified immunity. We, men, should learn to balance a set of books on our head that looks like an anvil instead of a veil for posture in the figurative sense, standing in God's eyes where God, like the future, is female, a prophylactic against distraction, a cork stopper in the mouth of a gun. So the... The book that I'm working on is called Spectral Evidence, and the basic premise, the logic behind it is that, you know, I was reading um, Darren Wilson, the police officer who shot Mike Brown in Ferguson, I was reading the deposition, and he says, Mike Brown rose up like a demon before me, right? And then I was curious and then looked at some other depositions, and they very often will have recourse to spiritual, sort of supernatural, rather, language to describe the people that they had to shoot because they were so terrifyingly, supernaturally overpowering. Um, so anyway, where did that, what, what, where have we seen that before? In the whole history of burning women as witches, of course. So I, a large part of the book is, is reading the thread through um, the witch hunting and the, the kind of legal theoretical framework for rationalizing and institutionalizing male fear and justifying it and how that has survived today in the extrajudicial killing of black people. Um, so one major figure you won't be surprised comes up is, the, is Tituba, who was the, 
the, the woman who started the, no, she didn't start, the kids started, but the Salem witch trials. Right? She was uh, an enslaved woman. Um, I don't know what else to say. Well, she survived, which was really interesting. Out of all these people who were, who were executed, she, uh, she was one, maybe the only one who, who lived. The, po- the, title, the poem's title is Occult. Zero your scales to the burden of a lash, dear justice. But let Tituba clumsy the magistrate's minds with a wag of her wizened index. A flight risk near forests of the Wampanoag where Christians savaged Queen Widamo's corpse. What else might Tituba, non-white and woman, haunt but a margin of error? She's a catbird song trapped in the chimney. She's egg whites in water. She is the tumescence of smoke. Dear Mami Wata, let Tituba prove to be the stone that splits the stream of their vision. Let her renounce sight and be unseen. Let her cough ground coral in the shedding of a pewter moon that she, of all the innocents, should live. Dear three-headed Hecate, replace her the unthought thought, with wax, twigs, horsehair, and straw. Let her not appear as a witness, nor as evidence. As with the talking dog, let her be the hoodoo that speaks through their mirrors. Let a long-tailed avocado ghost the floorboards, tempting a red cat, his familiars, the devil and his counsel, the canary. Let her conjure the man in black, they fear, who charms pilgrims on the road to paradise disguised as a harmless bird watcher. Dear Nemesis, let her feed the court a few names from his register, a taste of her truth, her mise on a beam, her one hell that calls forth another. With no standing on her own behalf, let her sit in judgment. Let this power invested of gavel and oath help her give birth through her mouth like a god. All right, now wrap up with um, this poem. Oh, I'm supposed to wrap up with that. You can read that poem. I'm going to wrap up with this poem. Orange. The famous athlete doubts the earth is round and sweet. Its magnetic navel adrift escapes like leaves turned dryly underfoot. As in summer, autumn comes, a flame deflates atop a skull. As in youth, a beauty dims, its fruit yields quietly to flies. Eluard writes, the earth is blue like an orange. From the bone-white surface of the moon, watch it spin and quiver as on a globetrotter's finger. Watch it molder, watch it turn to ash and glitter in the solar wind. Thank you. Well, there we are. Craig, thank you so much thank you. for that luminous reading. It was absolutely um, transcendent, as were both your readings, Ashenda and Oak. And um, hearing you read a cult and I was just picking up on, I guess, some resonances from Ashunda, your reading as well, where it seemed like there were notes of supplication Mm -hmm. being raised. And so I thought perhaps we could start off our conversation by maybe hearing any thoughts you might have to offer on how poetry in, maybe, maybe, maybe I'd love to hear you talk about in what ways do you think that poetry may approach prayer or traffic in sort of the same modes? Do you think of, prayer, of poetry as a, any type of prayer? It seems like just being in this sacred space that trying to draw together um, some inquiry around the resonance between poetry and prayer might be interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, sh- sure. Uh, there's a poet, uh, 